Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my dear sisters and my brothers. Welcome to part five of this fourth installment of Al Isra and Al Mi'raj, where we answer the question of if the Quran is the sole authority, how did we then learn how to pray? And as I said before, Every time you bring the issue of the Qur'an being the sole authority in Al-Islam and that Allah has told us everything that we need to know in Al-Qur'an, people always will get back to you with one question they seem to agree upon, and that is, if the Qur'an by itself is enough, then where in the Qur'an it says that we have five daily prayers and that Dhuhr has four, Maghrib has three, and Fajr has two? And if you cannot answer that, they will tell you, well, you learned it from the messenger. And that's the sunnah. And because you accept that, then you should accept all else, i.e. all the other hadith. And uh, this talk, as I said, endeavors and will answer this question. But anyhow, in this talk here, we have reached the fun part, the part where we trace the origins of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. So, and it's really worth reminding that the Qur'an has completely alienated the Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj story. You see, when one looks at the size of the event and the space Allah gave it in the Qur'an, one cannot but marvel, really, it's strange. Allah talks about a variety of much less important issues, yet completely discounts such a huge event as Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. I'll give an example. Let's say two companies reach two inventions. Two companies make two big discoveries. One company invents a miraculous cure against cancer, which means no more cancer. Let's say it's the end of cancer. But another company invents and discovers a plaster that you apply on any cut on your skin and when you remove the plaster it doesn't hurt. Now you have the media and the state and everybody around the country, guess what? They would completely ignore the cancer cure and would write articles upon articles upon articles and interviews and everything about what? The painless plaster. You get the idea. The same thing here. Allah talks in the Quran about a variety of different things, but Al Isra and Al Mi'raj completely non existent. And uh, for example, yeah, He tells us about okay, it's okay for you believers to eat as an individual or a group. But you see, Allah talks to us and He tells us okay, you can eat by yourself or in a group, no big problem. But He doesn't speak about Al Isra and Al Mi'raj. That's strange. He even talks to us about the number of times on a daily basis where your kids, your children, should give adults some privacy. Yet he doesn't talk about the incredible journey that a human has experienced traveling thousands of miles from Mecca to, Al to Jerusalem and then only Allah knows how many millions miles all the way to the heavens and all the way to the seventh, back to Jerusalem, back to Mecca, completely non, non existence. Allah uses a woman's plaited hair as an example that for someone who undoes their belief. But Al Isra al Mi'raj, nothing at all. Allah uses dogs, donkeys, ants, bees, snakes, sticks, honey. All these things are well explained in the Quran but not Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. Allah mentions in details a meeting between Sulaiman and the Queen of Saba, the Queen of Sheba. But nothing in details about Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj and what happened. So when you look at the context, which is more important here? Is it a journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and then to the seventh heaven? Or the journey a woman makes from Yemen to Palestine to meet a man? You get the idea. Because the big problem that we're facing today is that when the Quran has marginalized this non-existent idea of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, we find on the other end, books of hadith and statements of sheikhs, it, every year we celebrate this event that doesn't exist. Because you see, we have to understand one thing, yeah? It is a habit of Allah to tell a story or an event or, and then he would retell it in different ways and manners, a couple of times, even more. 
Why? Because Allah wants to drive a lesson or add something to it. For example, take the story of the creation of our father Adam and what happened in, in the, the train when Allah put him to train him and the shaitan incident. At least seven times that story has been retold. Yet Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, nothing, zero. It's, it's incredible. Because you have to keep in mind that Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj defies all kinds of laws. Physics, time, space. And by space I mean when we humans on earth, we can only walk on hard surfaces. We can't walk on air and we can't walk on water. So when we are told that the messenger Muhammad was taken to heaven and that he moved through the heavens and in each of those heavens he would find prophets and messengers there. The question comes in, uh, were these messengers floating on air or is there a hard surface in the heavens? When they say the Prophet Muhammad walked in the seventh heaven to go meet Allah, how did he walk? Did he walk on hard surfaces or did he just float? And then in which point we should add to his miracles that he is the only man that have floated. You see, Jesus walked on water and Muhammad walked on air. It just doesn't make sense. You see, anyone who takes the time to study the content of this epic but fictional and fabricated chronicle, you see, with all the different chapters, will undoubtedly find out that the whole thing stinks. This is the kindest expression I could find to describe this nasty lie that has caused and is causing us a lot of problems. You see, there is an old saying that says, no smoke without fire. So if Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj isn't true, so how did it come to the world? Who invented it? Because the amount of details of these stories is incredible and is actually very good to be turned into a movie. The Lord of the Rings type of movie, Harry Potter, The Hobbit, you know, that kind of uh, fictional big movies. Of course, if we give that to Mr. Jackson and we tell him, look, these are the, the script of the, of the journey of Muhammad, please turn it into a movie. I'm sure he could make it into a movie. Because there is no smoke without fire, this talk will tell you where the fire is and how the smoke of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj found its way in a beautiful religion that Allah has completely ignored this Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. You see, the history, as the history goes, the, the smoke of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj has its roots in the Bible. Both the Old Testament, i.e. the Torah, and the New Testament, that is the Gospel. Yes, you heard it right. Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj is nothing but an interpretation of events that took place in the Torah and the Injil, i.e. the Gospel, or the Bible of the Christian today, and is told about different people, and it tells about their ascension to heaven. The events are the same, it's just the stars are different. What I mean by that is, see, when someone tells you a story of their adventure somewhere in the world, then you go and tell the same story, the same adventure to other people, but you put yourself at the heart of that adventure. Not the original person, but you put yourself, then you make it your own story. This is exactly what happened in Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. The journeys of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj did not occur to our messenger but rather is an adaptation of other stories told in the Bible. But what happened is the sheikhs of old who didn't have much knowledge about the Bible and things like that, what happened is they removed the original people and they put Muhammad right in. Of course, they did a little bit alter here, change a little bit there. But as you will see, Muhammad and any other people have shared the same experience. Surprise? I don't blame you, really, I don't. Because you have been duped. And the sheikhs as well, out of their ignorance and their blind belief in the hadith, have already been duped before, and they are misguiding people. The stories about a human ascending to heavens to meet up with God is, is, is incredible. 
and they have been told by high priests in the church, the rabbis in Judaism, or the temple guardians of different dogmas like Hinduism and Sikhs and Buddhism and things like that, storytellers, poets, and all that kind of stuff. So whoever of these religion figures wanted to be boosted, guess what? The believers would tell incredible stories about that messenger or prophet or God so that people stay in awe. Oh my God, that messenger had experienced that. Then they must be special. They must be close to God. These people use the prophets, the wise men, the sages and all those things. And stories got invented. Incredible fictional stories which purpose is to raise those people, i.e. like us, Prophet Muhammad, Moses, and everybody else, Jesus, and everybody else, to raise them high in the eyes of people. Our sheikhs in the early days of Islam, and all the way till the third centuries, when they documented that, you see, because at the beginning of Islam, people used to tell stories. In the third centuries, they wrote them down. And when they wrote them down, this is what has been followed since then. They became a law. Bukhari, Muslim, Ahmed, all, anything that you know today was written on the third century. That's why you have famous like Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Al-Tabari, all those people oh, <laughs> are authors of that era. And that's why they must remain alive. Because by keeping them alive, whatever they wrote stays with us. You see, my dear sisters and my brothers, prophets, wise men, sages being overpraised and celebrated, hey, guess what? After all, these people were blessed, chosen by God himself. They must be special, right? But then again, when they were presented to people, they were presented as these are the hands of God. And the hands of God was with them. They were unconditionally supported the messengers and all these high people they lived through some of the out of this world experiences they fought great armies and won and the armies the enemies were big in numbers but these people were really a minority the, these special people the messengers and everybody met with gigantic beasts and after heroic battles guess what they killed them even in our, in the life of our messenger, they tell us the story about one day a camel, and this hadith is authentic. They say a camel invaded al Madina and he was extremely angry. People were scared of the camel. And as we know, when camels get angry, they can kill. Guess what? And then the messenger came out and he saw people scared and he asked them what's the problem and they said, oh, there is a camel and it's very angry. So the messenger went to meet the camel. When the camel saw the messenger, of course, the books now are going to create the drama around it. Everybody is scared of the camel, but when the camel sees the messenger, it goes to the messenger and does a curtsy. I can lower its legs or lower its neck. And then they said the messenger brought his ears to the mouth of the camel and the camel talked to the messenger. After that, the messenger told them, this camel has spoken to me and told me that his owner of the camel was mistreating him. He feeds him little and makes him word a lot. That's why the camel was angry. What a nonsense. What a lie. Why would the camel take it on people of Al Madina? Go kill your owner. Why? But Allah, as I said, it's over, over, over uh, emphasizing and over boosting the personality of the messenger. But anyway, in other, in the Bible, they beat dragons, armies of snakes. They crossed deserts. And the water would come out of their hands, just like it happened to our messenger when he just, they say, he stretched his hand and water started coming from between his fingers. And the sheikhs believe in it unconditionally. They say God runs miracles through them. Of course, oh, they are special, right? And they had special power and, 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 and. Really, the list is endless. Of course, each people, each priest, each rabbi, each temple, each sheikh, each scholar each, uh, would tell the stories and tales about their prophets in such a manner that no one else comes close to them.
You see, for the Jews, nobody is above Moses. For Christians, nobody is above Jesus, son of Mary. For us, the believers, nobody is above Muhammad. For the Hindus, who believe that their faith is timeless and has always existed, they believe that nobody is above Vishnu or Shiva or Brahma. For the Buddhists, nobody is above Buddha. You get the idea. The Incas, they have prophet, each one of them. Even though Allah in the Quran has ordered us not to differentiate between any of his messengers, as far as we are concerned, all the messengers are at the same level. Let me give you an example. When we in the streets, when we are walking, when we see a policeman, a police person in the street, do we favor them? To us, all police people are the same. That's it. As far as we are concerned, police people are the same. Yes, they have ranks between them. But as far as we are concerned, we would obey the command of a police rookie or a policeman who has 20 years of experience or a general, for that matter, a policeman. And that is exactly what Allah wants from us. As far as we are concerned, all messengers have the same ranks. Allah favors them, that's him. But you and I, we have no right to that. But for us, the believers today, guess what we did? We did everything but obey Allah. Muhammad, they tell you, is the best of creation. He is the best mankind. He is the best that walks the earth. He is the, Allah loves him so much. On judgment day, he will intercede. On judgment day, he will open the gates of paradise. On judgment, all this is lies. <laughs> On judgment day, Muhammad has absolutely no weight. He will witness only once that we Muslims have abandoned the Quran. Actually, on judgment day, Jesus will speak more than Muhammad. And that, of course, doesn't make Jesus special. It's just going to, Allah is going to ask him, Hey, Jesus, did you tell people to worship you and your mother instead of Allah? And Isa is going to say, no, I didn't do that. And then Isa will, Jesus will answer the question. But, but you see, it's more about uh, what Christians are doing today in associating Jesus and putting him at the same level with Allah, actually making him part of Allah. That is a big problem. So, but anyhow, so the use of superhuman status quo to control and submit the masses to a practice or religion has always been here. You see, because the leaders of the organized religion institution, and this could be Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hindu, any religion that has an institution is an organized religion. When Allah sent Prophet Muhammad, Messenger Muhammad, he sent him to break down any institution and make the religion between you and God. Yet our sheikhs did everything to make the religion between us through them to God. What they say, they tell you, is what God wants. And of course, all these are lies. But anyhow, so those great adventures that are absolutely magnificent, far-fetched and impossible to the normal person would alleviate all the other messengers. Most times these stories are told in a manner that will make the listener come like get lost in the stars themselves. Reading a poem to people is as good as both the words and the fashion with which you read the poem. For example, if I say to you, I walk the street and I find a nice boy and he was eating ice cream. That's it. But if I say to you like this, I was walking the street and uh, I saw a boy and he was eating ice cream. You see the enigma that I have created just by telling you the same story that I said the first time, which to you is not nothing, but the second time you suddenly found yourself interesting. And you are, you find it interesting and you are interested in the story themselves. This is exactly what happens when people want to manipulate other people. They will take a story and tell it in a way. And Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj is just one of those stories. The real purpose of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, this big lie, is aimed at putting Muhammad high above all else.
and give the Muslims that kind of boost to boost about their message. Oh, Muhammad is better than Jesus, then we must be better than Christians. Muhammad is better than Moses, then we must be better than Jews. When Allah has told us, no, all Allah's messengers are equal because that's who we are. We all are equals. We all are humans. And the best of us is the most pious, the one God fearing and does good on earth. So, Al Isra and Al Mi'raj. Let's jump now to this Al Isra and Al Mi'raj, the origin. This fanciful and fictive story comes like many others from the Holy Bible. You're not going to believe, but we have tons of what is in Islam today that comes from the Holy Bible. Either the Old Testament, that is the Torah, the Torah, or the New Testament, and that is the Gospel. As we go through the stories of the Bible that I'm going to tell you now, you will see many similarities between what's in the Bible and what's in the Hadith. And of course, our sheikhs and scholars did the impossible to garnish Muhammad's version, to make it the best that is out there. Of course, all this is done in the spirit of making him better than the Bible's characters. Which happened, you see, back in the third century, when the, the Baghdad back then got opened and all different cultures came in, Jews were free to preach, Christians were free to preach, and different cultures came in, Muslims found themselves just face to face with so many great stories told about Jesus, about Moses, about the Hindus, about the Buddhists. And guess what? Some of these stories that people liked were taken from Ju Judaism, Christianity, and were adopted. Guess what? They were adopted to Muhammad. And that's how they ended up in our books. But anyhow, as I said, so many things have happened in the Bible, and today those things are given to the persona of Muhammad. One of such people is Idris, the prophet of Allah, Idris. And in English or in the, in the Latin forms, he's called, he's called Enoch. Enoch is Idris. Of course, there are a few other people, and uh, as I said, without any further ado, let's get to it. So as I said, the Bible contains a brief but intriguing verse that mentions how one human being, and that is Idris, who didn't die, but instead was raised directly to the heaven. Allah's prophet Idris was the only man who was taken alive to heaven. Guess what? Allah mentions Idris in the Quran and he mentioned him only once. What Allah told us about Idris is really interesting and actually very much worth studying because what Allah did and what Allah told us, he told us absolutely nothing about Idris and his people. It's, there is no uh, the normal stuff where the prophet goes against his people, they don't believe in him and something happens. No. Allah just said, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Idris," And mention in the book of law, the Quran, Idris, Enoch. Okay. Okay, Idris, what do we know about him? Allah says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا Idris was truly a man of truth and he was a high prophet. Okay. وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا and we elevated him to a higher place. This is in Surah Maryam 19 from Ayah 56 to 57. That's all we know about Idris in the Quran. Nothing much. According to, so when Allah mentions this, as he said in other parts of the Quran, that he mentions certain things to correct certain beliefs that are in the Old and the New Testaments in the Bible. Because according to the Bible, Idris was taken up to heavens so that he doesn't see death. Christian books and Judaistic or uh, Jewish books tell us that Idris, Enoch, was very much loved by God. One day, Idris was nowhere to be found. In the second book of Enoch, in the Bible, it describes the ascent of this patriarch, Enoch, uh, Idris, Okay. The patriarch, because he is the ancestor of Nuh. The, uh, he's like, but anyhow, so Idris goes 
all the way through the ten heavens of an earth-centered cosmos. So I'm going to now move on to the tale itself. The tale is fully mentioned in the second book of Enoch in the Bible and is also known as the book of the secrets of Enoch. Enoch, as I said, is Idris. The story is most noted for its description of multiple heavens and accounts of the battle between the angels and devils. And it really is entertaining account, as entertaining as the Isra and Al-Mi'raj itself. And you will see, when I tell you the tale of uh, Idris, you will understand where the idea of the heavens come from. This account is thought to have been known by and to have influenced by the Apostle Paul, who wrote the New Testament. But anyhow, who describes his own experience of being taken up to the third heaven. You heard right? In the Old Testament, Enoch, Idris, went all the way through the ten heavens. But Paul, the Saint Paul, the Apostle Paul of Christianity, was also ascended, was taken up by Allah all the way to the third heaven. Well, guess what? Let's leave the Apostle Paul tell us about what happened to him, and I will get back later on to what Idris or Enoch experienced. Paul says, I must go on boosting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, i.e. somebody who believes in Christ and is speaking about himself, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, speaking about himself, Paul here, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And this brings the idea of people debating, did the messenger go in spirit or did he go with the body and the soul? Because the debate comes because now you see where the similarity is. And then he carries on, Paul carries on. And I know that this man is still talking about himself, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And that's when they tell us that Prophet Muhammad, when he was in the heaven, he saw the, uh, the angels. He heard the angels writing our actions, and there were certain things he was not allowed nor permitted to tell. Now you see the similarity. The story goes that at heaven number three, Paul is still able to see the earth below. By heavens number four and five, he is in the realm of the angels. Number six, I have a number six, is the place of great light. And number seven is the place where Paul now sees an old man. By the time Paul gets to level 10, he is reunited with fellow spirits, i.e. people who die, the good people go there. Although the details of this upper echelons is pretty sparse. We don't have much information about that. In the longer third and fourth century text of the same name, Paul, but it takes a similar heavenly journey with Haim singing, angels, gates of God, and an old man to greet him. But the overall tone of the work is far more sinister, culminating in chapters 31 and 44 with a description of a hell occupied by lukewarm and rebellious sinners and a few church leaders. What I'm trying to tell you here is that Paul has experienced a journey. He didn't go through heaven one to three. He, he missed one and two. He straight away goes to three. Okay, when he get to number three, that's where he started his journey. When he got to heaven four and five, that's the realm of the angels. That's where the angels live. That's where they conduct their business. When he got to number six, that's where he saw a great light. And when he got to number seven, that's where he saw an old man. I ask you a question now. 
in the Isra and Mi'raj, doesn't Rasulullah say that when he got to heaven number seven, he saw an old man and that the old man is Abraham? Now we see the similarity, seven heaven, old man, Isra and Mi'raj, seventh heaven, old man. But anyway, then uh, Paul goes on to number 10, he, he keeps his journey. When he gets to number 10, he joins back with the fellow spirits. And he doesn't have much information to tell us. There is another on the 3rd and 4th century Christian church, right? That is 300 years before the coming of Prophet Muhammad. Other texts have been added. And now they said that there were some hymn or hymn singing angels and there were gates of gold and still there was an old man. And this is further emphasized in chapters 31 and 44 with a description of hellfire that it has a lukewarm and there are some rebellious sinners inside hellfire and also some few church leaders also in hellfire. The question is, when the messenger goes into hellfire, which, as I said, doesn't exist now, but you can have now, you can see the similarity between what the Bible says and what the Isra and Al-Mi'raj says. According to the Bible, both the old, when I say the, the Bible, I mean the old and new. If there is any difference, I will emphasize. Otherwise, when I say according to the Bible, I mean the old and new testament, okay? There are eight people who were ascended to heaven. Yes, you heard right. According to the Bible, eight people have ascended to heaven. There is a great doctor in the United States. His name is Dr. James Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. And he runs a very interesting website, okay? And uh, this man wrote in January 2013, one article, and the title of that article is, If I Ascend to Heaven, Paul's Journey to Paradise. So the title is, If I Ascend to Heaven, and then Paul's Journey to Paradise. So he's going to speak about Paul and what he experienced. And this article was published on the award-winning, and they have an award-winning website called the Biblical Archaeology Society.org. So if you go today to the Biblical Archaeology Society.org, you will find Dr. James Tabor, who is the main person there, and you will find his article. This is a nonprofit society founded in 1974 in the United States, and it's a dedicated Christian website. Dr. James is the chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina. He is a professor on Christian origins and ancient Judaism. So he is worth his, uh, as a, he, he's somebody we should listen to when he talks. They say since earning his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1981, Tabor has combined, Dr. James has combined his work on ancient texts with extensive field work in archaeology in Israel and Jordan. Dr. James is highly respected and regarded in the Christian world today and is, as I said, the man behind his website, the Biblical Archaeology Society.org. In shorter words, Dr. James Tabor knows pretty much what he is talking about and what he says is listened to and is respected, taught and studied around the world. Now let's go back to his article, If I Ascend to Heaven, Paul's journey to paradise. Dr. James Tabor says, Paul is not the only one in antiquity reported to have experienced such a heavenly journey. What few readers of the New Testament might not realize is that the phenomenon of the heavenly journey is a rather common one. In Paul's time and stretching back several hundred years before him, i.e. before even the coming of Christianity, heavenly journeys was a common thing. So actually for Prophet Muhammad to have gone from Jerusalem all the way to the seventh heaven is nothing new. It's not like it's the first time that's been recorded, but rather few things before that had happened. Then Dr. James Added, uh, added, there are several types of such journeys, i.e. the ascension to heaven. 
each with its own specific meaning, contexts, and applications. He further says, there are five figures in the Bible who, according to the standard Jewish and Christian interpretations, are reported to have ascended to heaven. And I will mention those five. Number one, Enoch, Idris. In Genesis 5, verse 24, so Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it reads, Enoch walked with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. In second person, Elijah. In Hebrew, it means my God is Yahweh, which we Arabic translate to Elahi, Ilya. In Arabic, it's Ilya. But anyhow, they say when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, whirlwind. Till the Bible gives a detailed account on how Elijah was taken up to heaven. It reads in Kings 2, chapter 2, from verse 1 to 12, it reads, As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up in heaven in whirlwind. That's what it is. The third one. Jesus, son of Mary. While he was blessing them, i.e. while Jesus was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Furthermore, after he said this, he was, i.e. after Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. This is in Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. The fourth person to have experienced those heavenly journeys, Paul. The Apostle Paul, Saint Paul. And I've already read this, but it says, I know a man in Christ, i.e. who believes in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And this is in Corinthians 2, chapter 12, verse 2 to 4. And uh, the fifth one is John. And I'm going to read now some passages from the Bible, from the Old Testament, right? And this is chapter 4. The title of this chapter is The Throne in Heaven. I will read, and please, as I read, just listen and you will find a lot of similarities between what the Bible says and what Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj stories, the Hadith in Bukhari and all these things say. So as I said, it says the throne in heaven. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunders. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. 
Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and forever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. As I said, this is in Revelation chapter 4, verse from 1 all the way to 11. As you have guessed, the one sitting on the throne is Allah, and everything else that surrounds him are all Allah. Actually, there is a hadith, and this hadith is authenticated. It's in al jama al sagir authenticated by Albani, by Suyuti, al munziri and a few others. But anyhow, the hadith says that there is a rooster, the male of a chicken, whose head is under Allah's throne and whose feet are on earth here with us on earth. This huge, I don't know what it is, this rooster. And all that this rooster is doing is saying to Allah, holy, holy you. If humans knew of your majesty, they would never ever have associated to you. You can see now where that text comes from. It comes from the Bible. Let's carry on to chapter 5, and the title of this chapter is called The Scroll and the Lamb. The Scroll and the Lamb is still in chapter 5 in Revelation. It goes something like this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, i.e. Allah, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the throne could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, i.e. he took it from Allah. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, bear in mind th these songs shall be sung to John, an apostle John, a prophet John, so to speak, okay? So, and now they were singing this new song saying, or telling him, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God's person from every tribe and language in people and nation. You see, from the days of old, Anyone who dies for the sake of Allah, it, his blood or her blood is so important. But anyhow, and then they carry on saying to John, of course, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and then 10,000 times, 10,000 times. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise.
Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is Revelation chapter 5 from verse 1 to 14. Chapter 6. The title is The Seals. John carries on saying, I watch as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder. You see the scrolls, that's the seal. So the scroll has seals and he opens one of them. So like a voice like thunder, it says, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Now you understand the two winged horse? See how the boy at the Bible is? This horse is in the heaven. But anyhow, I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest, i.e. on his way to conquer some land or some place. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. This is Revelation 6 from verse 1 to 16. Chapter number 7. 144,000 sealed. After this, I saw, still John talking, okay? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from, from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. There, I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And then he says, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. In our sunnah, they say when the beast shall come out, it will stamp people on the forehead, believer, disbeliever that idea comes from this one here where it's talking to these creatures to these angels and he tells them do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the foreheads of the servants of god that comes from here then he carries on saying then i heard the number of those who were sealed 144,000." from all the tribes of Israel. Then he goes into each and every of the 12 tribes of Israel and how many of them, the 12 tribes. But you know, what he's saying is of all the 12 tribes of Israel, right, who are Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Shimon, Levi, uh, he's naming the brothers of Yusuf because there is Benjamin and there is uh, Joseph, okay? In each of those 12 tribes, there are 12,000 people who will be not going to hell fire. Remember there is a hadith that says one day that the messenger of Allah came, he says 70,000 of my ummah, of my nation, of the Muslims, would go to paradise without even being held accountable. And the company said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you uh, tell us who they are? And then he went ahead. That number is because of this kind of numbers here. He gives a number, they give a number. Anyway, let's carry on. This is chapter 7 from 1 to 8. Chapter 8, The Great Multitude in White Robes. This is the title of that chapter in Revelation. Chapter 8 from 9, verse 9, all the way to 17. It reads, after this, okay, now why I'm reading all this to you? Because in each book, in each part, in each passage, they took something out of here and they put it in Al-Isra and Al-Miraj. That's what they did. Is that the, the Bible talks like so many lines. They take just one line and they say, okay, this is what happens. 
So as I read, just pay attention and whatever you know about Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj will jump out at you. So the great multitude in white robes. After this, still John talking, okay? After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The throne is sitting in Allah and the Lamb is Jesus. But anyhow, they were wearing, wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd, cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus. They call him the Lamb because they say God sacrificed him for our sins. That's the reason why. But anyhow. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulations. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Remember in uh, just uh, part uh, before this one where I said that the messenger said that I entered the house of Allah and you can see here and they serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his, with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst, the sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. This is where the idea of the fountains and the messengers, people drinking from his fountain, and they call it the kawthar and the hawd and things like that. This is where it comes from. From this where he will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Revelation chapter 8 from 9 all the way to 17. Now we go to chapter number 8, the seventh seal and the golden censer. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven and about half an hour and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, you know the idea that uh, when the trumpet will be sounded at the end of the world? It comes from the Bible. The Quran doesn't mention any temple and nobody's going to blow on anything. The world will end with Allah's command and we will raise with Allah's command. Nobody's going to blow no, no uh, trumpet. The idea of the trumpet comes from the Bible. Now, anyhow, let's go on. They go, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The, the altar is where you put people to sacrifice them. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes and lightning and earthquakes. As you can see, the Bible makes a joke of Allah, 
sitting on a throne with a few thrones around it, the angels doing that and somebody offering incense. The, you know, the incense is you burn for good. I actually have one right by my side here. So, and the, the, the water and all, the, it, it really makes, and this is where the story of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj where Rasulullah was talking to Allah. Allah put his hand between the shoulders of the messenger. Allah taking different forms and morphing different shapes and things like that. All these were taken from biblical texts adapted and turned into a hadith. And that's why it is an ongoing lie that must stop. Then there is a section which speaks about the trumpets. It says then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass were burned up. So talking about the day of judgment before the end of the world. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze i.e. full of fire, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Actually, the stories are really, really long. If you wish to know the whole story, please pick up a Bible uh, which has the Old and New Testament and read in the book of Revelation, starting all the way from chapter 4 and keep reading till you go beyond chapter 16. It's full of details about this heavenly journey of Saint John. It really is. And you, if you study it well, you can take from Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, you will see some lots of similarities there. And the Bible is so full of all these kind of humans ascending to the heavens and back again and telling their tales. And if you want to read further, please check the following references and search them on the internet. Look for uh, all the related accounts, as I said, from Yahuwah, Allah, books of revelations, and you will get a lot. Just go on the internet and type uh, anything about judgment today, ascension to heaven, Christians, and you will have tons of information. I'm gonna go now to other people that have been to heaven and back. And believe it or not, we have Moses, and Aaron, Aaron is Harun, brother of Moses, and the elders of Israel. Again, Musa, Aaron, and Nadab, and Abihu, and there are 70 elders that, you know, the Quran speaks about Musa taking 70 people, the elders of Israel, to go and ask Allah for uh, forgiveness because of what the children of Israel have been done. But anyhow, here is what it says in Exodus, Chapter 24, from 9 all the way to 11. And so the God of Israel, so they ascended and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli. This is a bright blue as the sky rock. But anyhow, that's what I say, a br as bright blue as the, i.e. God was standing on a ground floor that is made by this lapis lazuli uh, that is as blue as the sky. This is a rock which is semi, uh, sorry, semi-precious. It's, it's, it's even more prized since antiquity from the old, old day because of its beautiful, vivid colors. But then there the Bible goes and says, but God did not raise his hand against these elders and these leaders of Israel for the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. There you go. The 70 people with Musa and Haron went to meet up Allah. They saw him and they had a nice feast. They ate and drank. So this is Musa and Haron's trip to the heaven and before them, Again, there is Jesus and few others, as I said. Again, it is normal that the men of religion in the third century would invent Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj to pump up the status of Prophet Muhammad against all the narratives. Because people will say, hang on, how come the children of Israel, Jesus, Musa, Harun, John, oh, how come all these people have been to heaven and why not Muhammad? That must not happen at any cost. 
Muhammad had to have an Isra and a Mi'raj story. You can find the full story about Musa's journey and Harun's journey and 70 elders of Israel in Exodus 24 from verse 9 to 11. It's, it's uh, incredible. I will stop here because I've passed the hour and I will carry on, inshallah, uh, in part two of this uh, origins of the Bible. Salam.